All right, great. All right, so I would, and again, thank you, Matt, uh, for introducing me. Yes, I'm Avi, and uh, um, um, also, um, I, I've started my uh, career as an Oracle DB, and then I worked on MySQL and some other relational and uh, even some NoSQL databases, right? So, uh, so I, I mean, during this presentation, I may be relating uh, um, a few things to some of the other databases as well, right? So today we are here to talk about the mostly mistaken and uh, ignored parameters while optimizing a Postgres database. And uh, I mean, by the end of this um, um, uh, talk, I assume that uh, most of you could be, um, you know, again, get, getting into uh, your production databases and validate some of the parameters if they are like untuned or if you have to tune them. So I hope this talk would help you. All right, and uh, so before um, I before I actually start to talk about those parameters, um, um, I mean, if you would have uh, seen uh, uh, Matt's uh, uh, talk, uh, uh, you know, a few hours ago, like um, he mentioned about um, the most of the performance issues um, being caused due to the lack of parameter tuning, and this is something uh, that we come across every day, right? Um, uh, like. Nowadays, we've been doing a lot of migrations from Oracle or other databases to Postgres and MySQL. And upon migration, uh, the testing teams complain stating that, um, you know, the performance with Postgres is so bad. And then when we go out and look at the parameters, they're never touched, or they may have been tuned considering Oracle or the source database. So when you are tuning a Postgres database, you need to tune it like a Postgres database. And at the same time, the default settings that are already configured for you are only suitable for minimalistic server configuration. If you just go ahead and import data from Oracle to Postgres and you started it, you may not see great performance. Uh, you have to tune some of the important parameters as well and make sure that you tune them according to the workload. And at the same time, um, you know, we also see majority of the databases uh, with auto vacuum turned off, which is a biggest mistake. Um, unless you really know how to tweak that logic and write your own huge logic of, uh, uh, you know, auto vacuum, because it does a lot of things. We'll be discussing that uh, during this talk, but you should never be uh, disabling or turning off uh, auto vacuum, assuming that it improves performance. And then uh, sometimes you may want to uh, disable the uh, logging of tables to write ahead logs, um, you know, but when you're doing that, make sure that you know the consequences and you're, you're doing that for a purpose, right? You're, you're not doing that for the actual production tables because you are hitting on uh, durability. I mean, the durability in the asset property is gone when you avoid uh, wall writes. So by default, Postgres enables asset by default, unless we turn off some of the settings. And also one important point to note is that Postgres does allow us to configure uh, you know, many parameters, um, instance level, database level, a session level, and even a transaction level at a user level. Like you could configure uh, most of the parameters at uh, whatever level you want, because you may not want to enable a, a parameter like a global level and uh, let that be in effect for everything that's happening across the instance, right? So Postgres does allow you to set a lot of settings, uh, you know, in different, different uh, uh, aspects. So before we get to uh, um, go ahead with um, the parameters, I just wanted to make sure that you see the architecture diagram of Postgres. So on the left side, you see the processes, uh, the background processes. So Postmaster is the uh, parent Postgres um, that actually serves even as a purpose of a listener, if we talk in Oracle terms or it's a super user process that actually um, uh, forks a backend process for each new connection. At the same time, there are several other background processes that will be running always to take care of a lot of activities. For example, a checkpointer, a background writer, archiver, wall writer, logger, auto vacuum. Okay, likewise, we also have several um, um, uh, aspects in memory that we need to consider like work mem, maintenance work mem, and even shared buffers, wall buffers. So all these comes under the memory area. 
So we're going to talk about all, most of these today. So that's why I just wanted to make sure that you look at the architecture diagram quickly, right? So let's start with the mistaken parameters. So I might rather need to mention it as the mostly mistaken parameter, shared buffers, right? Especially when we come from an Oracle world, we would go ahead and uh, set it to the magic number like 40% of RAM to shared buffers. Or maybe if you are from the MySQL world, you may want to set it just like how you set uh, the InnoDB buffer pool, like could be huge value. But you may not do that with Postgres. It is of course the RAM that's allocated to shared buffers. I mean, shared underscore buffers is a parameter that sets the amount of RAM that can be allocated to shared buffers, right? And it's a database memory area. You could consider that way. So it contains the pages being modified or read, right? And um, it of course uses, uh, just like the other databases, it uses the least recently used uh, uh, algorithm to flush the pages from the shared buffers. But how to set it correctly? It looks so good until now, right? But the important point you need to note that, uh, notice that Postgres does not do uh, direct dial, right? So what it means is, if let's say you're running a select, uh, uh, you know, from an employee table, right? It requires page or block number 24, for example. Um, and that needs to be fetched from disk to shared buffers uh, because um, the page is not found in memory in shared buffers. So unlike Oracle or MySQL, right? Postgres, if it's not found in shared buffers, it would request the operating system to get that page. And the OS would now go ahead and get that page from the disk, load it to cache and then copy it to shared buffers. So it, you may consider it as double caching. Um, and uh, so most of, the, uh, most of the times, like you see lots of blog posts and even um, conferences, like people will be, people be, people be talking about uh, OS uh, cache being the first preference, right? So you rather leave more RAM for caching and set less value for shared buffers, and that would be more optimal. So you might have seen uh, the Postgres documents where it actually says 24% of uh, total RAM, or sometimes you may even see uh, 8 GB magic number being suggested because of some other uh, uh, sorts of uh, benchmarks done in the past. But you do not have to go with those assumptions. Like you may have, you may be able to go ahead and start with 25% of your total RAM, uh, but later, you could definitely change it uh, through, uh, you know, by running several benchmarks in your uh, machines, right? Like you could even set it to 90% of total RAM. Like we did a, a benchmark recently wherein when we increased the uh, shared buffers value, um, we were able to see more performance and that's possible when your entire database or your hot data, like the active data set can actually fit in memory, right? And that's when you could go ahead and set uh, or give a greater value for shared buffers. And if you cannot, then leave lesser room for shared buffers so that more amount of data is actually cached in RAM. If you set, let's say like 70% of RAM or 50% of RAM to shared buffers, then the amount of um, data that's actually cached in shared buffers and the OS cache could be same, right? So you're not actually letting more data to be cached. In order to see what's in shared buffers, what are those tables uh, that are in shared buffers uh, and um, uh, what percentage of a table is in shared buffers, you could use the extension PG buffer cache. So you know what's in your cache, you know your hot data set. And you could also use PG stat statements extension that actually shows the number of pages that actually were read from shared buffers and the number of pages that were read from disk and loaded to shared buffers for each SQL. That would actually give you a great uh, assumption towards, uh, uh, you know, what what could be the portion of uh, uh, data that's always um, uh, fetched from shared buffers for a query. And you could also use pgstat.io user tables and pgstat.io user indexes to see, uh, you know, the uh, uh, number of, uh, um, the amount of uh, uh, tables and index scans from cache, right? So you could also use explain analyze buffers of a query, right? When you run explain, like you could run explain analyze buffers query and uh, you need to understand that you need to uh, use that in a transaction and roll back that if required, because that actually runs the query and gives you the uh, plan data, data. So you need to make sure that you also go ahead uh, and uh, take care of that before running it. So you, when you run explain analyze buffers, it would even show you the number of 
pages that actually were read from uh, shared buffers and uh, the number of pages that actually were read from disk to shared buffers. So all that uh, data is actually very clear to you. Uh, so that way you could really see, you know, if all of your data is actually able to fit in shared buffers. Workmem is again, one of the most importantly uh, mistaken parameter, right? I mean, it, it's one of the most important parameter that's always mistaken. So this is the uh, memory that's allocated for each sort operation. Like when you do order by like uh, stuff, right? Like hash tables are created and, uh, and at the same time, um, uh, even when you're doing merge joins, like you see um, sort operation happening and complex queries could also involve more parallel sorts. So it's not that for each query, only one sort operation, it could be multiple. A number of sort operations could happen for each uh, query. It defaults to four megabytes. So, so much of memory would be allocated to each sort operation. How to set it correctly, right? So uh, if the, uh, for sorting purpose, if the memory is not enough, the allocated memory is not enough, right? It of course starts uh, writing temp to disk. And as you know, anything that's happening in memory is more faster and anything that's written and read from disk uh, in the form of temp files is slower. So you need to see like, um, you know, which is better for you, of course, memory always wins, right? So then let's say, you went ahead and tested against a couple of queries and you saw that a lot of temp files are being written. Like you may need to set work mem to 512 megabytes or one GB. But when you set it globally, what happens is, um, you know, like each sort gets so much uh, work mem allocated, right? And that could be um, causing out of memory issues as well, right? So instead of uh, allocating global value, allocate session level value. Right? So you could also use explain analyze buffers here to see uh, what is the optimal work mem for a query. Because um, you know, that also tells you how much of um, uh, data is actually um, uh, you know, written to disk, right? Um, uh, and how much of temp files are generated, right? And then you could go ahead and set session level work mem, right? So you just say set work mem to uh, you know, 512 MB only for that session, but not globally. Right, and that actually improves the um, uh, sorting in that session only, right? So in order to avoid out of memory, uh, you could use this rough estimate, wherein you say like the number of active concurrent connections during peak, right? Let's say you have 10 active concurrent connections during peak, times average sort operations per each connection, because we said that complex queries could involve more parallel sorts, average sort, operations, average such sort operations, times the workman that you allocate, right? Should always be much lesser than the total RAM minus shared buffers that you allocate plus maintenance workmen times auto vacuum max workers. We'll be discussing these two parameters a little later and you would easily understand uh, this formula in case you, you're not aware of those already. So effective cache size, right? It's only used for estimation purposes by the planner. And it's just an assumption on the available uh, cache for each query, right? So it defaults to four gigabyte. When you set it to lower values, what really happens is that it, the operating system, I mean, the Postgres would actually prefer the sequence scans over index scans, right? So if you are actually helping the optimizer by setting it to, let's say like 50% of the RAM, right? Um, I mean, you, you could look at what's, um, um, uh, I mean, when you do free hyphen G in Unix, you see free and cast, right? When you do a summation of it, um, whatever you see can also be set as an estimate. So it does not pre-allocate so much or it does not block all of this area in RAM, right? It just helps optimizer understand that so much of uh, cache is available. So you may be able to go ahead and prefer index scans because Index scans are considered a random seek and uh, sequence uh, page fest is you, uh, fetch is usually more faster. Um, you know, it, for that reason, uh, it assumes that the indexes are not cached and rather prefers a sequence scan. So that could be one of the reasons why you could be looking at a full table scan, like a sequence scan in your uh, uh, database happening more often. You could also set this to 70% and be more aggressive, right? And um, 
it does not reserve any memory as i just said earlier right so it's only used for estimates so you'll be definitely safe enough to set this to 50 or 70 percent auto vacuum is definitely one of the most uh, mistaken parameters too like you set it to off which is definitely a mistake right in case you set it to off so it what does auto vacuum do when you turn it to on it starts an auto vacuum worker process on tables when a certain thresholds are reached right so that's what the auto vacuum does it just starts auto vacuum worker processes so what do, what does these worker processes do it freezes the xids to avoid uh, uh, the transaction id wrap around which uh, which could be considered as one of the uh, uh, problems that you need to avoid uh, through routine monitoring and uh, you would also be um, uh, uh, looking at auto vacuum cleaning the debt tuples, the bloat, and updating the free space map so that the uh, you know the cleaned up debt tuples, the space used by cleaned up debt tuples, will be used by the future inserts and updates. And auto vacuum also helps updating the. I mean, the auto vacuum worker processes also updates the statistics so that the planner really generates efficient costs. So just never set it to off. That's it, right? Else you have to write your own uh, uh, manual vacuum logic. Instead of disabling, just try manual vacuum uh, um, you know, for tables uh, on which the auto vacuum is not running. Track counts. Um, it's usually set to on by default. Even the auto vacuum uh, that I discussed uh, just a, a slide ago, right? even that's set to on, right? Unless we explicitly set to off. So even track counts is set to on. So when, you, when track counts is set to on, uh, basically uh, like um, the activities such as inserts, updates, and deletes, like whatever is happening, all those are counted, right? Like it, all those are tracked. And that will be, these statistics will be used by the auto vacuum process to uh, queue the vacuum and analyze workers for a specific set of tables like what table needs to go through a vacuum what tables need to go through a analyze like all of that will be um, based on the statistics uh, when you set track counts to on again to uh, uh, from, from now on we get more technical about the auto vacuum and uh, we ensure that uh, you know all of you understand uh, these important settings um, because these are the things that you would globally tune and you need to know if you have to globally tune it or tune it table level. So auto vacuum, vacuum scale factor, auto vacuum, vacuum threshold. So auto vacuum, vacuum. An auto vacuum, vacuum starts on a table when the formula, following formula is reached. The total number of updates plus deletes on a table is equal to auto vacuum, vacuum scale factor times the total number of tuples plus the threshold. So what is auto vacuum scale factor? If it's equal to 0 0.2, it means 20% of table records. It's a fraction of the table records that we add, that'll be added to the formula. Likewise, threshold is a number. It defaults to 50. You could set it to 40, 100, 200, right? Um, so it's a minimum number of obsolete records. Let's say you do not set the vacuum scale factor, right? You set it to zero, for example. And then Auto vacuum, vacuum threshold is the only uh, value that will be considered in this formula. So when sum of updates plus deletes is equal to auto vacuum, vacuum threshold, which is 50, then, a, then an auto vacuum, vacuum should actually run on that table. For example, if auto vacuum, vacuum scale factor is 0 0.2, total number of tuples or records in a table is 1000, and the vacuum threshold is set to the default 50, then use it with the above formula, for every 250 updates plus deletes, we see the table as a candidate for an auto vacuum vacuum, right? Likewise, an auto vacuum uh, uh, worker process would start within each database every auto vacuum nap time second. So if there are n databases, a new work worker is lodged every auto vacuum nap time by n seconds, right? If you have more databases, then the nap time is, uh, uh, you know, less between uh, the auto vacuums. And so a slide ago, we discussed about auto vacuum, vacuum scale factor and the vacuum threshold. Now we are going to talk about analyze scale factor and analyze threshold, because you all know, right? Like um, vacuum is to clean up the data poles and uh, freeze XIDs and, you know, so 
um, it, it does some things that way. But analyze would update the statistics, which will be used by the optimizer. So when should an analyze happen on a table will be determined using the um, uh, auto vacuum analyze scale factor and analyze threshold. So uh, what do these parameters mean, right? So an auto vacuum analyze starts on a table when the following formula is satisfied. So the sum of inserts plus updates plus deletes is equal to the auto vacuum analyze scale factor times total number of tuples plus the analyze threshold. So if the analyze scale factor is set to 0.1, it means 10% of total records, which is the analyze scale factor. And threshold again sets to 50 by default. So for example, if your analyze scale factor is set to 0.1 for 1000 records with an analyze threshold of 50, for every 150 inserts plus updates plus deletes, we see the table as a candidate for an auto vacuum, right? So an analyze would happen and automatically uh, the statistics get updated, right? And um, uh, so the auto vacuum launcher process spawns the worker process and these worker processes take care of either vacuum or analyze. So depending on all the thresholds that we just discussed. So now let's discuss about thresholds much more in detail. So global parameters alone may not be appropriate all the times, right? Because regardless of the size, a table may be eligible for auto vacuum. For example, consider two tables with 10 records and a million records. The frequency at which a table with 10 records can be vacuumed or analyzed is more likely, right? When, uh, I mean, it is more higher when compared to a table with million records because a table with 10 records, even if it has got, uh, you know, two records that are updated or deleted, it could be a candidate for vacuum. Whereas a table with million records, thousands of records or tens of thousands of records may need to be updated and deleted in order to get an auto vacuum vacuum or in order for it to become a candidate for a vacuum or an analyze, right? So in such cases, you could rather go ahead and look at setting table level auto uh, or vacuum settings. Like you could say, alter table, table name, set, auto vacuum scale factor equal to you know, zero, and vacuum threshold equal to 100, right? For the table with 10 records. Or for the table with millions of records, you could rather set the threshold to a bigger value or the scale factor to higher value so that that frequently accessed table may be a great candidate. At the same time, you should also be ensuring that you have manual vacuuming in place through proper monitoring. And also remember that auto vacuum worker, max workers are limited to three, right? So no more than three auto vacuums could actually run at a time, right? Uh, with the default settings. So what about the cost, right? What about the cost of auto vacuum? An auto vacuum reads eight KB uh, pages from disk, right? And then uh, it modifies those eight KB pages. So it involves both read and write IO. So an auto vacuum would do a read IO as well as a write IO. So there are some IO parameters that you need to know so that you know why you have to tune these to it, right? So the auto vacuum vacuum cost limit is the total cost limit that the auto vacuum could reach combining all the auto vacuum processes and the cost delay. If the total auto vacuum vacuum cost limit is reached, then sleep for so much time. Vacuum cost page hit is the cost of reading a page that's already in shared buffers. Vacuum cost page hit miss is the cost of fetching a page that's not in shared buffers and vacuum cost page dirty is the cost of writing, a, a, writing to a page, you know, when some uh, dead tuples are found in it. So these are, you know, the estimations that are used in order to uh, determine uh, how much work can be done by auto vacuum on the whole. Let's see that in action with some settings. So the default auto vacuum vacuum cost limit is set to 200, cost delay is set to 20 milliseconds, cost page hit when the page is found in shared buffers is set to one, when the page is not found in shared buffers for read it's set to 10, and the cost of dirtying or writing to a page is set to 20. Like an auto vacuum doing these tasks, right? It's a cost of the vacuum. So let's imagine what can happen in one second. Assuming that it's a, it's the best case scenario, latency is zero milliseconds, the read latency. 
So the vacuum cost delays 20 milliseconds. So an auto vacuum can actually wake up and go for sleep 50 times, right? Because 1000 milliseconds, it could um, uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, get delayed by 20 milliseconds, right? So that means an auto vacuum, when the cost limit of 200 is reached, it sleeps for 20 milliseconds and gets back again, right? So that could happen 50 times, right? And uh, so 50 times the auto vacuum, vacuum cost delay is nothing but one second. So now let's look at the read IO, considering that example. So if all pages with dead tuples are found in shared buffers, right? In every wake up, 200 pages can be read. So in one second, 50 times 200 by vacuum cost page hit times 8 KB. That means an auto vacuum could read 78 megabytes on the whole for all the workers combined. Likewise, if the pages are not found in shared buffers and it has to read from disk, then 7.81 megabytes per second can be read. And likewise, when it has to write or dirty an auto vacuum, it could only dirty up to 3.9 megabytes per second. Now, if you go ahead and increase the auto vacuum max workers, which is the next, set, next setting that we're talking about, which defaults to three, assuming that it would tune the auto vacuum, then what really happens is that the vacuum cost limit of 200 is actually shared by more workers and your auto vacuum is further delayed, right? So for that reason, you have to ensure that you also increase the vacuum cost limit considering that considering the IO that your uh, database uh, the, uh, disk can actually handle. Because if you set it to 2000, it means 781 megabytes per second can be read from the disk. Likewise, 39 megabytes of writes can happen per second only by auto vacuum, right? So this needs to be into, uh, taken into consideration. Maintenance work, ma'am. Again, most of you might be already aware. It's the amount of memory uh, that will be used for maintenance operations like create index, alter table, add foreign key. So when you're doing a database restore, increasing maintenance work mem could be helpful, right? So, and auto vacuum also could use maintenance work mem amount of memory. I know in the source code, it's kind of hard coded to one GB, but still you could set auto vacuum work mem to a certain value so that you don't use the maintenance work mem for auto vacuum, right? So, yeah, and uh, also make sure that you check the following formula, like number of concurrent maintenance operations during peak times the maintenance work mem should be much lesser than the total RAM minus shared buffers plus work mem times max concurrent connections times N, where N is the average parallel sort operations for each connection. You could again, uh, I mean, in the interest of time, I'm just rushing through it, but you could always download the slides and go back through the presentation. These are some things that you need to slowly digest. And we'll talk about four ignored parameters as well. And the ignored parameter, one of them is random page cost, right? So what does this mean? It's definitely a frequently ignored setting, right? It's a cost of non-sequentially fetched disk page. So especially the indexes, right? And um, as the query planner is cost-based, it assumes that the cost of fetching an index is huge when you set random page cost to four, which is default, and your sequence page cost is usually set to one by default. So your database might actually uh, have got lots of queries doing a sequence scan. And you could be surprised to why an index could improve the performance, right? And uh, for that purpose, you could go ahead and set it to the same value as one, especially when you're using faster disks, because nowadays SSDs are default. Wall compression, right? This uh, started from 9.5, if I remember, 9.6, if I remember correctly. Default is off. So it, rises, it, it writes a compressed to full page image when you set it to on to a write ahead log. So that way you're writing less content to write ahead logs, but of course at the cost of CPU. We have seen it improving performances, uh, uh, performance in most of the times because uh, you know, in one of the benchmark we have seen 3,000, uh, three terabyte uh, gig, uh, you know, three terabyte of walls in 10 hours got decreased to 1.9 terabytes, right? Which is, which actually gained a greater amount of TPS even in our benchmark. So you may want to test that as well. And uh, checkpoint timeout. One more important parameter that you should never ignore because checkpoint timeout uh, forces a checkpoint 
you know, every so many minutes. The default is five minutes. So the, if checkpoint timeout is set to five minutes, the checkpoint happens every five minutes. And whenever frequent checkpoint happens, it does cause a lot of writes because for every checkpoint, the first modification of that page, right, will be a full page write. And the subsequent writes to that page will be only the change vector. So what really happens is lots of full page writes could happen when your checkpoint frequency is too low. So you can minimize that by increasing the checkpoint timeout. And that can be 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour. And it could also increase the crash recovery time and a shutdown could take more time. And the last parameter that I would like to talk about is a completion target. It's set a default um, of 0 0.5. And when your uh, completion target is set to 0 0.5, it means a checkpoint write is spread across 0 0.5 times checkpoint timeout, which is 15 minutes. You could set it to 0 0.8 or 0 0.9, which means you're spreading it to 27 minutes so that you're actually writing in a bigger interval, but not a shorter interval. So your writes are spread across a bigger window. So yeah, and um, at the same time, max wall size can be increased hey, Bobby, as well. Yeah. But we're, we're gonna get cut off here in a second. So I just wanna make sure you're aware. So it's a Zoom okay. gonna cut us off because we've only got a certain amount of time, so. Yeah, yeah. all right. So, so yeah, so likewise, max wall size is the amount of walls, uh, um, you know, when uh, you set, uh, uh, you know, for example, let's let's say, you set it to one GB. When one GB amount of wall is about to reach, a checkpoint will be triggered. So you could rather go ahead and enable checkpoint warning to much lesser than checkpoint timeout so that you could say that, okay, I need to increase my max wall size so, my, so that my checkpoints are not happening in a much lesser window because a checkpoint can even be triggered not only when a checkpoint timeout is set, but also when a max wall size amount of walls are about to reach. So you may also have to tune your max wall size so that you could um, let the checkpoints happen, you know, in a wider interval. Yeah, so um, you could also look at, uh, you know, other OS metrics as well as uh, connections, connection puller, what's happening in your database in order to tune your database and moving tables between different table spaces to distribute the IO, loaded tables, partitioning, indexing in order to tune, but make sure that you are you know, tuning your, um, um, you know, database using all, most of the configuration parameters as we discussed in these slides. And please do not forget to take the survey um, uh, because we would love to know the state of the open source software market. And- uh, All right. You. Thanks a bunch, Avi. Uh, th this was great. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, we're, we're at our time um, and uh, feel free to hang out on Slack and continue to ask questions, but uh, that's our show, everyone. Thanks a bunch. All right. Bye. Bye.